You know, Black History Month uh, is a longtime tradition that was started by Carter G. Woodson. Uh, started out as Negro Appreciation Week. I think it was 1926, I think. Um, as a way to highlight and exemplify or amplify the contributions of African American folks, um, particularly in a moment and a time where, at least to Carter G. Woodson, in both high society, quote unquote, the most exclusive places where uh, people of intellect and knowledge and wisdom gathered, uh, he felt that the erasure of the contributions of African American folk, black folks, those who have descended from the enslaved African uh, people were just not being uh, mainstreamed, if you will. Started out as Negro Appreciation Month. He picked that uh, week in February because it was the same birthday of Frederick Douglass. And if you know who Frederick Douglass is, he was a wonderful, wonderful freedom fighting intellectual person and also shared the same birthday with Abraham Lincoln. Uh, it was not just an arbitrary choice on, on the, the behalf of Carter G. Woodson, but he believed that it was very important to put a mark in the ground and say that we're going to amplify these contributions. And over time, that week turned to a month. And so it's so important to appreciate that you don't ever know that uh, what you start could actually become something much bigger than you could imagine. I know some folks say we got the shortest week or month of the year, uh, but it actually just started out as a week. Uh, so in many respects, uh, the vision of Carter G. Woodson was attempting to exhaust as much time as possible as, as could be imagined in his own time and place. And it is, I certainly believe, because of the institutions that black folks ran and stewarded that what started out as a week became a whole month and now it is something that is celebrated literally all across the world. This idea that you and I and we have something to contribute, that God has placed something in your hand, something unique, some genius, some idea, some uh, 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 gift to the world that is unique to you and your person. If nothing else, if you wake up every day and just show up as yourself, how many know you are making a contribution? You ought to pat yourself on the chest and say, I am a contribution. Amen. And uh, I hope that you appreciate that there is something important about starting from a place of asset and not deficit. That we are, uh, at our core, uh, something that is uniquely, the scripture says it like this, fearfully and wonderfully made. Amen. That even if you don't bring nothing to the table, just God making you has literally brought the whole world status up a little higher. It's so important to start from this place because we can often find ourselves in this society starting from a place of deficit. Uh, I'm going to read uh, the passage today in a moment, uh, Psalms 32. You can prepare yourself to go to that passage. But I was thinking about uh, preaching on this topic of uh, uh, don't let the devil steal your joy. Amen. And, and, and just, just, just wanting to, to encourage us today. And, and as I was thinking about this uh, message this morning, I, I, I recalled the, the, the rise of Afro-pessimism, which uh, is a, a, a important, I believe, and a powerful uh, 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 framework. It's an intellectual, scholarly framework that seeks to explain uh, the way in which our society uh, can only function with black folks integrated into it, but from a place of exclusion and exploitation. And when I remember first hearing about Afro-pessimism, you know, on its surface, it sounded to me like, you know, folks were just so down in the dumps about the state of black folks and marginalized people in our country that we were just falling into a perpetual state of, dis of depression. 
But the more I studied and read about this, uh, I appreciated how this was an actual framework similar to uh, the, the framework that uh, you know, folks now across the country are trying to literally throw out black studies and African American studies. Why? Because there's a desire to sanitize, if not erase, not just the contribution of our folks, but also the struggle, the, the, the wickedness, the, the trauma that has consistently been unleashed upon us and upon so many others. And, and what's so crazy about uh, this country's kind of march through time these days is that rather than just repenting and committing to not do it again, folks would rather just act like it never happened. It is as if repentance is their choice rather, I'm sorry, erasure is their choice rather than just repentance. And it makes me just ask God, Lord, help me not to fall into the, 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 the sin and the, the deception of erasure. Just because you erase history don't mean history didn't happen. Hello, somebody. And when you are party to a wrongdoing, how many know it is an important step to just acknowledge the harm, ask for forgiveness, and commit to not do it again? And that's just in every single relational context we are in. Everybody say, amen, that we got to literally stop harming folks. We got to acknowledge that we were a party to that, ask for forgiveness, and certainly commit to not doing it again. And so when I think of this idea of don't let the devil steal your joy, juxtaposed against this concept of Afro-pessimism, uh, I hope to give all of us a sense of, I don't know, an invitation to hold on to your joy at all costs. Hold on to your joy at all costs. Uh, Psalms 32, uh, this is our lectionary passage for the day, and uh, I, I had some, some other passages I, I, I was compelled to read, but I wanted to start here with the lectionary because I, I find these words to be so important uh, as a framework for perhaps our conversation. It's 11 verses. We're going to uh, really focus on the first verse and the 11th verse. I want to look at the bookends of this chapter, but we'll read all the verses just because I like for you to see and read uh, the scripture as much as you can. <laughs> I know for many of us, this may be all we do this week. Lord, help us. Amen. But here we go. Happy. Somebody say happy. Happy are those whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Happy. Somebody say happy. Happy are those to whom the Lord imputes no iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. While I kept silence, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. Anybody ever had the hand of the Lord heavy upon you? Praise God. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. Selah. And then I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not hide my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Man, wouldn't it be something if everybody just used this, this formula on a regular basis? Amen. When, 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 when you're overwhelmed by the mistakes you've made, when you know that you have caused harm, rather than trying to hide from it or wiggle out of it, you just acknowledge your sin to God and invite God to forgive you, and literally the guilt of your sin goes away. Verse number six, therefore, let all who are faithful offer prayer to you at a time of distress. The rush of mighty water shall not reach them. Verse seven, God, you are a hiding place for me. Woo, how many love to just hide out with God from time to time? Lord, have mercy. I feel like preaching right there. Right there. Anybody know what it is to find a hiding place? Yeah, yeah. Amen. You may be on your job. You may be at your house. You may be walking through the park, and you're like, God, if you can just take me away. <laughs> Anybody ever felt like that? God, just take me away. I'm tired of this world. I'm tired. 
And God don't take you away. God will give you a hiding place. Just a quick reprieve. God will give you a glimpse of your future. God will give you a sparkle in the, in the sky. God will give you a hiding place. God won't just let you suffer under the conditions of your circumstances without giving you a breath of life and newness. How many of you ought to expect a hiding place in God? I, that's not me supposed to preach that, but I, I got to park there just for a second. Lord, have mercy. Give your neighbor a high five and tell him God is my hiding place. Amen. God knows how to give me a hiding place no matter. I don't even have to be in church to get my hiding place. Woo. Lord, let me keep moving because I may mess up. You preserve me from trouble in your hiding place that God gives you. God will keep you out of trouble. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Some of y'all are like, I, I missed that last time. <laughs> Amen. They pushed the wrong button and I missed my hiding place. You surround me with glad cries of deliverance. Verse number eight, I will instruct you and teach you the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Do not like, be like a horse or a mule without understanding. Lord, pray for the horses and the mules. And ask yourself, am I a horse or a mule? Whose temper must be curbed with bit and bridle. Else it will not stay near you. Many are the torments of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds those who trust in the Lord. Verse number 11, be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy. Somebody say shout for joy. All you upright in heart. Amen. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. All right, I want to start from the first verse. Happy are those whose transgression is forgiven. And I want to end with the 11th verse. And shout for joy, all you upright in heart. I want to talk about happiness and joy. And I want you to commit today, don't let the devil steal your joy. Let's pray. God, we want to say thank you, Lord. For the word of God that has been read for us, the people of God, we ask you to hide this word in our heart so we will not sin against you. Send your anointing that makes the preaching and teaching easy. We'll say thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. amen. We used to sing a song when we were in children's church or, you know, we didn't have children's church back then. I don't know if it was Sunday school. I don't know. Uh, but it, it used to go like this. I got the joy, 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 joy. Down in my heart. Where? Yes, that was to say. So I say, where? You say, down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart. I got the joy, 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 joy. Down in my heart. And then the last line says, down in my heart to stay. That's a richly theological song. You know, it is so important to remind ourselves that there is a deep, deep, deep down place in your body, spirit, soul that the devil can't access. I want you to understand what I'm saying. And when I say the devil, I'm talking about the devil you can't see. And I'm talking about the devil you can see every day. How many of both of those exist? I want you to understand. Now, I like to spend most of my time fighting the devil I can see. Because the devil I can't see, you know, I'm only told to rebuke the devil. I can't see. If I resist that devil, that devil will flee from me. So I don't spend a whole lot of time in demonology and sat satanology and, you know, the church of Satan. and work. I don't spend a lot of time there. Amen. Because, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm already won, won that fight. Amen. You know, somebody say, if the devil shows up, what would you say? I'd say what Jesus said, get behind me, devil. But there's also the devil we can see. There's the systems. The scripture says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, spiritual wickedness in high places. And I'm telling you, there are some high places. How many of you work in institutions with high places? <laughs> mm -hmm. Folk that you know is up there scheming. They, they up there with a plan. 
They up there with a diabolical uh, 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 plan to, to literally squeeze as much from you and I and us. They're takers, not committed to reciprocity. Whether you are dealing with the devil you can't see or the devil you can't see, you want to always remind yourself that there is a deep, deep, deep place in your constitution that the devil can't access. God has created us with deepness. And one of our greatest tasks is to always remind ourselves that there is more to us than we can see with the naked eye. That you and I are people constructed with multiple kinds of gifts and talents, and those gifts and talents together constitute what God would call a, a fearfully and wonderfully made person. And part of our constitution is always realizing that there are certain things that you can reach for and, and grab, and there are certain things that have been placed inside you that no one can access, but we must always cultivate. Some things you can grab a hold to through the power of your own strength. But other things have been given to you by God as a gift, and your job is not to grab it, it's to cultivate it. Are you hearing what I'm saying today? You know, there's some folk out here, if, they, if, if you trained them, let's say, I don't know, math. Any mathematicians up in here? If, 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 you went to two, if, you, if you were a mathematician and you were gifted with math, I mean, you were formed with the intellectual prowess and, and, and the sensibilities where it wasn't nothing. You could, you could look at an algebraic equation and you soak it up like a sponge first time. How many of those, that, there's some folks gifted like that. And then you got some folk with a, a lot of tutoring and training. The best they gonna do is slide on by. But you may not be gifted in math, but you're gifted in writing or reading. Or you're gifted in, in arts or you're gifted in administration. Just because you're not gifted in one thing doesn't mean you don't have a gift. But part of what you got to appreciate is the thing you're gifted in is a gift from the almighty God. God gives it to you. You can't grab a hold to a gift that God gives. God already gave it to you. And your job is to cultivate it. Well, this is a distinction I want to make between happiness and joy. We can pursue happiness. And this is what this country likes to say. We are about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But how many of you know that the pursuit of happiness can be elusive if the structures and systems are set in a way where you are like the rat running on a wheel, always hoping that you go fast enough to get off the wheel. And there may be moments where you get the little cheese. Whew, that's some good cheese. That effort paid off. But happiness can be very episodic. Happiness can be very elusive, and we ought to have happiness, don't get me wrong. But I want you to know that happiness is not what God is preoccupied with when God creates us and when God enters our life as a, as a guide and as a sustainer. God gives you joy. Happiness is what you grab. Joy is given to you so you can cultivate it. You can pursue happiness and never get it. You will always have enough joy to cultivate. One you may never get, one you will always have. And the world will try to steal your joy. 
The world won't try to steal your happiness because the world always wants you pursuing that. But the world will try to steal your joy. But how many know the world's arms aren't long enough to get to the depths, the deepness, where God places your joy? Your joy is your divine purpose. Somebody say joy. Your joy is your divine calling. Somebody say joy. Your joy is that thing that causes you to have peace in the midnight hour. Somebody say joy. Your joy is that thing that even when all hell is breaking loose, you always got a little flicker of some hope. Somebody say joy. Joy comes from God. God gives you joy. And that's why Shirley Caesar used to sing a song and say, this joy I had. The world didn't give it, and the world can't take it away. Why? Because the world don't have the capacity to get deep enough into what God has created in you to take your joy. People may die, but death is not deep enough to take your joy. Whew, Jesus. You may find yourself in a depression, but your depression is not deep enough to take your joy. There are practices that we can engage in that can help us cultivate the joy. God gives every created being, particularly those who are tapped into the power of the Holy Spirit, what we call in the Christian faith is the fruit of the Spirit. Some people say fruits of the Spirit, but I like to say fruit of the Spirit. When you go to the store today, tomorrow, next day, I don't know how many of y'all eat grapes, but you don't buy one grape at a time. <laughs> at least I hope you don't. And you're picking one grape, <laughs> put, putting it on the scale. I wonder how much this grape costs. Hello, somebody. You don't buy one strawberry at a time. I wonder, it's a plump strawberry. Like, you know, I'm going to get you a second time about, gosh, I sure am hungry. <laughs> How much is it for, for one grape? I don't, want, I, I don't want all the grapes, just one grape. I mean, you don't shop like that. Fruit, fruit that you buy in a cluster is is a gift because you can't have one without the other. Fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, temperance, meekness. Uh, 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 what, I forget the other ones. Long-suffering, compassion, goodness. Against such there is no law, meaning there's nothing that outlaws you. If you have joy, you're going to have peace not too far behind. If you have joy, you're going to have some goodness, not too far. God puts this stuff deep down inside of you. And as we focus on Black History Month, folks going to the Black Joy Parade later, I, I, I know it's important for us to, to have these moments and events because they are a practice of us cultivating with intentionality, taking care of the parts of our lives that without special attention could just wither and die. God gives it to you, but child of God, we got to cultivate some of these things. Because if you don't cultivate it, the devil will work overtime to steal your joy. And while the devil can't steal your joy, the devil will keep working on it. And how many of you know if the devil's working on stealing your joy, you're going to get worn down. If you and we allow the enemy of our soul, the enemy of our purpose, the enemy of our divine calling, access to the deep part of us, the devil may never get there. The enemy may never get there. The forces may never get there, but they will wear you down. I ever felt worn down. Like, man, I just, I feel like I'm surrounded by 
forces without and within. That's the enemy trying to steal your joy. But when you cultivate your joy, you begin to tap into strength. You begin to tap into purpose, into vision. So how does one cultivate joy? Well, I do believe that part of the cultivation of joy, scripturally, theologically, is through the practices of our faith. Again, if God gave it to you, that God will always give you tools to cultivate. You don't have to be confused about how do I cultivate joy. The way you cultivate joy is to stay connected to the one who gave it to you. And that is not a small thing. Because many of us can easily be seduced by the wickedness around us and forget God. Forget that God is real. Forget that God is active. Forget that God is near you. Pat yourself on the chest and say, God is near me. God is near me. One of the ways you cultivate joy is to stay in the presence of God. That don't mean you walk through your job waving your hand. I got the joy, George. No. You got to make a spectacle of yourself, especially if you don't know how to sing. Praise God. But staying in the presence of God just means, God, I am going to intentionally keep a prayer on my heart. We're talking about meditation this month. That, God, I'm going to meditate. I'm going to take some time throughout the day and just meditate on a passage of Scripture, on a wisdom saying. I gave a book of wisdom quotes to my daughter. And I told her, just read one of those a day. And I'm so glad she's doing it. Praise God. <laughs> Maybe so. I don't know. <laughs> but I, I want to commission you. Sometimes the way we stay in the presence of God is to keep God's presence ever before us. Through wisdom sayings. Wouldn't it be something if every day you found a nugget of wisdom, you wrote on a piece of paper, you, 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 you tabbed it to your, to your workstation, you, you had a reminder on your phone, and you spent 10, 15 minutes of the day just thinking on some new wisdom, some gratitude. While you're in the middle of all the devil trying to attack you, it is counterintuitive to stop and meditate on the goodness of the Lord. How many of you know your instinct is to fight back? when the devil starts running up on you. But if you start with the assumption, listen, devil, you can do all that you want to do, but you can't access my joy. Whew. I mean, imagine that. Whatever you're doing, devil, you ain't going to get there. <laughs> you ain't going to get there. You're going to be trying. I'm not going to say it ain't going to hurt while you're trying, but you can only go so far. And in the middle of my wrestling, God, I'm going to stay in your presence. And I'm going to eat some soul food. I'm not talking about no Everett and Jones, although, you know, <laughs> some good comfort food, praise God. That's, that's for happiness, amen. That's to get that endorphin kicking. I mean, no, after that soul food from down the street, you're going to crash. You're going to regret it. You're going to be looking in the mirror like, Lord, have mercy. That temporary satisfaction has a long-lasting impact. No, I'm not talking about that kind of soul food. I'm talking about food that feeds your soul. How do you think our people got through the hardest of eras? It wasn't because they were the most genetically and physically strong, although they were. I'm not trying to, you know, be an African exceptionalist up in here. But it is a point of fact that Africans, enslaved Africans, were not the first group of folks that were enslaved on this continent to till the earth. The first group were the poorest of the poor European. 
folks who were in jails and prisons, and they brought them over, and the diseases literally wiped them out. Then they tried to enslave the indigenous folk. Now, they weren't cooperating, first and foremost. <laughs> like, you know, this ain't going down. You, I got some home field advantage over here now. But many of the diseases brought over here by the Europeans literally ravaged many of our indigenous loved ones. But enslaved Africans had the ability, the strength, to outlast both the diseases and even the environment. There's something too powerful in us to just be erased by some external pressure. But even when they were destroyed in body, they were not destroyed in spirit. Why? Because there was something deep down on the inside. Don't you forsake what God has put on the inside of you. You may not always be able to measure it in a test tube up there at the Lawrence Laboratory of Science. But just because you can't measure it in the laboratory, whew, don't think it ain't something real on the inside of you, something your ancestors prayed for. They used to say that my mama prayed for me. Lord, I feel like preaching a little bit today. Had me on her mind. <laughs> Took the time to pray. I'm so what? Glad she prayed. Anybody still floating on the prayer from your mama in there? A anybody honestly can say, I know that I, I did my hard work and I studied like I was supposed to, but there was something else that got me floating through to this place of favor today. And that thing is deep down on the inside. Your grandmama and them was depressed, but you know what they used to do? Mm, baby, I'm just going to wait on the Lord. <laughs> Anybody ever hung out with your big mama and them? They just rocking, they just sitting there silent. Hours at a time. They fighting the devil trying to steal their joy. You know, I was young. I used to, I used to tease my grandmother now. Oh, they so funny. <laughs> now I'd be sitting there just shaking side to side. <laughs> Talk about this joy I have, devil. You can't take it away because it's on the inside of me. And I want you to know today, child of God, that God has given you something that is so unique that your faithfulness to that thing is what produces joy in the world. You may have some hardships, but guess what? The hardships, they help to cultivate your joy. It's like you may need some manure, some stinky stuff to help unlock some of the growth that needs to happen in you. I want you not to be afraid of the manure that comes your way. But I want you to tell yourself this ain't nothing but some soil that God is trying to put in my life. Because God knows there's something great inside of me. I know they're going to hate on me, but that's okay. That haterism can't access my joy. I know they're going to try to lock me out and block me out, but that's okay. My joy is too deep. And the strength of God is too strong. I know the devil's going to keep fighting against me, but I want you to know that God is giving you a joy that the world can't take away. And when you tap into that joy, and when you water and cultivate that joy, and when you live into that joy, even when you're going through hell or high water, you can come through on the other side with more wisdom and more power and more giftedness. Uh, somebody holler, don't let the devil take my job. And this is what black joy should always be about. Afro-pessimism, which I started with, should always or should be used as a way to explain the insignificance and the wickedness of the systems we have to live through. Afro-pessimism should Help us describe the intent of this wicked system. But it should not be used to prescribe our response to it. 
Sometimes you got to have the right analysis so you can fight the right fight. Hello, somebody. Some folk think, you know, if I get enough money, if I get enough power, and I get enough position, then I'm going to be able to beat this system as it is. No. The only way all of us win is if we change the system. The system can't stay the same, and you win when we weren't created with the system in mind, when the system wasn't created with us in mind. It means that every time you access the joy of God, it should be a creative transformative power and things should always look different when our joy is accessed you give me joy God does down deep in my soul down deep in my soul down deep in my soul I want you to leave today knowing that regardless of your race, your gender, your sexuality, your class, what you believe or know about God, there's something God put inside you that no human being can access. It's yours. Somebody holler, it's mine. It's yours. People are going to try to erase it, but they can't erase what they didn't give you. And they sure enough can't access it. Don't give that person that power. They can mess with you. Now, understand, folk gonna mess with you as long as the day. I got folk mess with me right now. And I'd be like, try Jesus. <laughs> Don't try. I'm <No>, just playing. <laughs> they can mess with you all you want, but there's something deep down inside. I mean, I want you to everybody just close your eyes. It's, uh, we, we about to close. I just want you to close your eyes and just do this exercise. I want you to imagine the most deepest point under the ground, the seat you're sitting in. I just want you to imagine as far as your mind can take you, to the deepest point beneath wherever you are right now. And I want you to time that by infinity. That's how much deepness God has created you with. That deepness goes way beyond the feet you can see with your eyes. It goes far beyond the tips of your fingers and high in the crown of your head there's deepness in you and guess what God has put a seed of joy at the bottom of that infinite place of depth and no one can access it but you and God make a commitment today that you're going to cultivate that deep place I'm going to daily find some wisdom. I'm going to find some art. I'm going to find my purpose. I'm going to find my divine assignment. And I'm going to cultivate it. Even those days when I got to cry and happiness is elusive, I'm going to cultivate it. Even when the devil is attacking me, I'm going to cultivate it. Because there's joy down deep in my soul. Come on, stand with me, everybody. You give me joy down deep in my soul. Down deep in my soul. Down deep in my soul. You give me joy down deep in my soul. Lift those hands, come on. Down deep in my soul. Down deep in my soul. Say it again. You give me joy. Down deep in my soul. Down deep in my soul. Down deep in my soul. You give me joy. You give me joy. Down deep in my soul. Down deep in my soul. Down deep. So God, I pray for the joy 
that has been gifted to us. You've placed it down in the depths of our being, God, beyond the physical realm, beyond that which our eyes can see. There's depth in us that the devil can't access, that that man or woman can't access, that that loved one cannot access, that that job can't access, that the wickedness of this system cannot access, that the economy cannot access. There's a depth in each and every person in this place. And I pray today, God, they will say yes to the joy, hallelujah, that you place deep down in them as we continue to press through the daily challenges of life, the realities of what it means, oh God, to often be erased from history, erased our contributions from our jobs, erased, oh God, from the contributions in our relationships or our families or our neighborhoods. God, I pray that we will always remind ourselves that as long as we got the joy of the Lord, the fruit of the Spirit deep down in our soul, they can't erase what they can't touch. They can't steal what they can't reach. So God, make us more aware of the joy. Help us to cultivate it. Help us, God, in those moments of low and hard places, God, to make a decision. I'm going to cultivate this joy. I'm going to make sure that I'm not pursuing that which continues to be elusive at the expense of cultivating that which is eternal, the joy of the Lord that's deep in our soul. And so bless us as we go into the world. God, help us to stay connected to the source of that joy, of that love, of that peace, of that goodness, of that discipline. And we'll say thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Hug two or three people. Tell them I'm not going to let the devil steal my joy. I'm holding on to my joy. I'm holding on to it. I'm holding on to it. Give God a hand. Praise everybody who knows you got joy deep down in your soul.